Good morning. Good morning to those of you in North, South, and Central America, and good day and evening to those from elsewhere around the world. We have a full house today with over 1,200 registrants. Because of Zoom limitations, many of you today are watching us on our live feed on YouTube, and welcome to all of you there, as well as those of you here in our Zoom room. I'm Rachel Bronson, President and CEO of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And it is my privilege to welcome you to today's virtual program, The Origin of COVID, Did People or Nature Open Pandora's Box at Wuhan? Featuring Nicholas Wade and John Mecklen. Nicholas Wade is the author of the groundbreaking piece we are discussing today. His extraordinary article shifted the global conversation about the origins of COVID-19. Was a major reason President Joe Biden instructed the US intelligence community to redouble its efforts to determine the virus's origin. And it has forced po political and scientific leaders worldwide to take seriously existing evidence suggesting that COVID-19 might have orig originated in a lab. Nicholas is a science writer, editor, and author of multiple books who has worked on the staff of Nature, Science, and for many years, the New York Times. When at the New York Times, his articles were cited as a major reason why the science section had become the most popular section in the storied newspaper. My colleague John Mecklin is the Bulletin's editor-in-chief. As a longtime editor of award-winning magazines, John has written for Foreign Policy, the Columbia Journalism Review, and many other publications, including, of course, the Bulletin. John was publishing stories in the Bulletin on the weak state of lab security well before the 2020 COVID outbreak. Then, as early as March 2020, he directed our editor, Matt Field, to take seriously the lab leak hypothesis a story that when, was, when published garnered more than 300,000 page views. We've been publishing regularly on this topic with articles from esteemed experts such as Philip Alensos in May, as early as May, 2020, and Milton Leitenberg in June of 2020 and many others. There's a revelatory piece by Laura Kahn on our site right now that I highly recommend. This has been a crucial undertaking given the importance of the understanding of the origins of this virus that continues to wreak havoc worldwide and the insufficient evidence to rule out either of the two likely causes, zoonotic transfer or lab leak. The bulletin is fortunate to have John at its helm of our editorial team. I'm pleased to be serving as today's moderator for this important conversation. We'll start the program with a short discussion among the three of us and then take audience Q&A for the second part of the program. If you have a question and you're in the Zoom room, please type it into the Q&A box found in your Zoom toolbar and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please note that, if, that we have many on this webinar, so we apologize in advance if we don't get to all of your questions. This program is being recorded and that recording will be available on our website at thebulletin.org. So now let's jump into the conversation. Welcome to both of you. Nicholas, let's start with you. In the opening of your article, you write that an honest look at the possible origins of COVID-19 has been hidden behind to quote, thick clouds of obfuscation that the mainstream media seems helpless to dispel. So how have you swept away some of these clouds? How have you done it and why have you done it? Well, I started into this uh, project when I read a remarkable uh, article uh, a year ago by uh, Yuri Dagan, who's a biotech entrepreneur. And he laid out in great detail how you could uh, take this virus apart and assemble it and manipulate it and change it all around. So he didn't endorse the idea that it had been manipulated in the lab, but he certainly put the possibility squarely on the table. And after reading his piece, I then started uh, following what people were saying as, as a sort of welcome distraction from the book I was meant to be writing. And uh, I found that there was almost nothing in the mainstream scientific media. This uh, possibility of lab leak was being um, pursued by uh, uh, little groups of, of scientists uh, who are working outside the established literature, often self-publishing their articles. And then I came across um, various uh, email exchanges, one of them operated by Milton Leitenberg. Um, so I, he has some sort of emails, that lists, and some of them go out to government officials, I think, and, and some to scientists. And at the, at the bottom table, the, the crumbs are left for the journalists, um, but they're very useful crumbs. And after a while, I felt I sort of knew enough about the subject to, to write uh, uh, an article. 
John, you've been following uh, Milton Leitenberg's conversations as well, and he was important to your, uh, your, to our coverage of the bulletin as well. Tell us what you were, were seeing there. Um, well, Milton early on uh, was not saying that it was a lab leak, but was saying that there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that it wasn't being taken seriously enough and sort of behind the scenes in his uh, list serve and, and whatever he was advocating for, no, this really needs to be looked at. And uh, we published some very even handed stories just saying, well, it is possible. Some scientists say, you know, it could be a lab leak. Others say it's, you know, natural origin. And Milton just kept agitating in the background, you know, saying, you know, no, we need to take this seriously. And eventually he wrote a story for us. And eventually he was the person who recommended that I take a look at what Nicholas had written. And he was right, it was worth publishing. Nicholas, what were some of these crumbs that you were putting together that, that, uh, that you laid out in the piece? Talk to us about those crumbs and, and, and the important ones that you wanted to share with the public. Well, I think the most interesting uh, one was the fact that you could you could tell rather well what Dr. Uh, Zhengli Shi, the chief Chinese coronavirologist, was doing in her institute at Wuhan, uh, because she had a grant from the National Institutes of Health, uh, not directly, but funneled through the EcoHealth Alliance in, in New York. And there uh, are abstracts of her grant proposal from which you can tell that she was basically taking um, spike proteins uh, from coronaviruses she had uh, uh, discovered in these caves in Yunnan. So these are novel coronaviruses and she was putting their proteins into the genomes of, of other viruses um, to, to sort of assess their capability for infecting humans. But this is just, although this has an innocent purpose, this is just the kind of experiment that could have and perhaps did lead to the generation of SARS-CoV-2. So um, on uh, John, that one too, I remember in, in early days, there was uh, information that was coming, that was out there and was being pulled off sites and people were trying to figure out what, what was happening um, in China. Nicholas was able to actually get us some visibility uh, into that just because of being able to track the proposals. You saw some of the difficulty in covering it too, right? As everyone was trying to scramble to figure out and still is scrambling to figure out what's happening. Yeah, it's, it's an exercise in sort of circumstantial evidence. And I think the value, I mean, we were trying every way we could to get into China and, you know, look at whatever we could get actual people who had been in China to talk and weren't having all that much success, frankly. And uh, Nicholas did a very good job of tracing some paper trails that other people had, you know, sort of mentioned, but not really going through thoroughly. I think that's a really excellent part of his article. Nicholas, I thought part of part of the article that was so compelling was that paper trail and just trying to figure out well, what at least did we did we know? Recently, there's been a lot of, of conversation around the fern cleavage site. That was an important part of your article. And uh, the David Baltimore quote was uh, quite important to that. Can you talk about that as well uh, as an important piece of this, uh, of this reporting? Well, when I was doing the piece, I didn't have the wits to call up uh, Dr. Baltimore is one of the most esteemed uh, virologists in the world. But after it had appeared in Medium.com, I got an email from him um, saying, um, uh, when I read this article, when I read about the fear and cleavage shine, I said to my wife, this is the smoking gun. Uh, he went on to say that this poses a, a, a challenge to the natural explanation. So, so I think there have been various articles in the press that have, have willfully misunderstood the totality of what he meant. He wasn't saying this is a smoking gun in the sense that it's conclusive evidence because everyone knows it is not conclusive evidence. He was saying this is a smoking gun in the sense of dramatic uh, evidence and, and 
what he meant by that was simply that, as he said in his next sentence, this poses a challenge to the natural emergence theory, which indeed it does. Yeah, there's uh, there is recent uh, piece just out. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I know that uh, Baltimore's P quote now is is being used in exactly that way, which would be very uncomfortable for a scientist of, of his esteem, which is it's always hard to come out and say anything's conclusive because it's all changing. So I think that that clarification is really um, important. Um, Talk to us a little bit. Uh, I, I assume most on the call have read the article. If not, uh, suggest that you do. It's an important one. Have you been surprised by the response? But this is a question both for Nicholas and, and uh, John on this one. Have you been surprised by the response? And, and uh, what do you think about the implications of the response? Well, I've been amazed by the response. I mean, after I uh, gathered enough material to think I had an article to write, I then offered it to publications uh, across the political spectrum, left, right, and center, and got a, 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 a wall of rejection so complete that eventually I decided, this is ridiculous, I must get back to my real work, um, but I'll write down everything I know to, to write this story out of my system. And I put it on this self publishing site, um, expecting it to sink like a stone. Um, thankfully, John uh, caught it just before it, it did. And then it just seems to have changed the conversation uh, overnight in a way that's very hard to uh, explain. My main thought is that it was the visit of the WHO Inquiry Commission to Beijing, um, which at first sight seemed a propaganda victory for the Chinese since they just dismissed uh, uh, lab escape is highly unlikely. But what I think was plain to everyone uh, was that the Chinese had failed to provide them with a shred of evidence in favor of natural emergence. So this, this scenario, which was very plausible to begin with, uh, has diminishing plausibility as no evidence in support of it came to light. So this, I think, sort of set the stage for the uh, sudden sort of transition in, in, in public um, perceptions. John, think, what, what, what made you, yeah, what made you want to, what made you take this up given what, what Nicholas just said? Well, in part because of <clears throat> what he did say, which is that he'd offered this to all these other publications, which had for most of a year treated the possibility of a lab leak as some sort of conspiracy theory. And I knew that's not true. Now there's, there's a lot of noise around here and some of the reason his article got such a huge response was, you know, some attempts to distort it on the right side of the political spectrum. But the reason I published it was because he had in a room. Oh, John, you just cut out your sound. He had. Oh, I think we lost John's sound. No, that's not better. Okay, we'll see if we can hopefully get you back, uh, John. Um, so Nicholas, let's talk about um, what, if anything, you've learned since. Um, one of the best parts of writing pieces that get attention is suddenly you will get a lot of additional materials come in. Some of it can be pretty crazy. Some of it's really important and the need to kind of sort through the differences. Um, have, what, what have you been seeing since? What's interesting to you? What parts of the story are you still following? Um, well, there hasn't been a lot of new information. Um, the major exception to that, I think, was this uh, trove of emails exchanged with Dr. Fauci, which was ob obtained uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. So most of this was redacted, and, and the rest was of very little interest, all except for one letter, uh, which I found quite electrifying, uh, which came from um, Dr. Christian Anderson. Uh, so he was the author of a letter in Nature Medicine in, in March of uh, 2020, which I think was the single most important uh, statement in favor of the natural emergence theory. And it said categorically that there was no way 
that the virus could have been manipulated. So this was this sort of just captured the public um, debate. So here was Dr. Anderson saying in an email a few weeks before his paper was published to Dr. Fauci that he and his group, four other virologists, were unanimous in thinking that the virus did not have an evolutionary origin, meaning it has to be man-made. So what on earth was going on there? Why did he change his mind? He doesn't mention this in his paper. There's not much evidence in his paper for why he did change his mind. He said on Twitter recently, he changed it because of uh, 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 several new genome sequences that were produced by the Chinese. But these genome sequences are, are held in deep suspicion by many people and may not be reliable. So uh, it, 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 it really is a puzzle how that letter got written and why those five virologists started off by thinking unanimously the virus was man-made and then changed their mind. John, do we have you back? Are you back with us? John? No, he can't hear us. Uh, let me talk and see, am I back? Yeah, there you are. Good, good, we have you back. Glad to can have you Can you hear back. me? Yes, we can, can you hear us? Great. Okay. I think I can John, hear think, you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we'll give you one more shot here. Yeah, we can hear you. So jump in now. But I think if it keeps cl clicking in and out, we'll probably just have to bow to the internet gods on this one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I I just came back in and just caught the tail end of uh, Nicholas's talk there. So why don't we go on to a next question, and I'll be. In at the start, okay. So. Well, I just wanted to get you in. I just want to loop back because I think it's important to the conversation about why pursue a story, a story that is so controversial, and you decided to go forward with it, um, and to to move forward on it and pursue it. So, so why? Well, it's obvious. It's to me, it's the biggest story in the world. It's you know, where did this world changing event of a pandemic? How did it start so we can prevent them from happening in the future? It was just obvious and it, it should have been obvious to many, many journalists. This is the most important story in the world. And so I decided to go forward because it just bothers me that much of the mainstream press was fervently avoiding reality. You know, the, the idea of journalism is to present reality not to avoid it because it might make you look like you're on the side of the Trump administration. You know, I, I just completely do not care how it might make me or the bulletin look if we publish facts and truth. That's, that's our job. So, and it's a great, a huge story. So why wouldn't we pursue it? Great, I wanna ask the last question because we have loads of questions uh, coming in from, from our participants and uh, really knowledgeable people. So let's just end there because it is something that I, the, the, and the, um, the article ends with, which is how many conflicting interests there are in this story and why it was probably more convenient to not address the possibility of a lab leak. Um, and I know when, when we were prepping for this conversation, John, that was something that you, you wanted Nicholas to, to comment on. So let's let's give this one to you, Nicholas. It's where your article finishes. Let's just talk about some of the conflicting interests and how hard this is to sort out and actually why we need journalists to push it forward. Well, I think the principal conflict of interest is with virologists and their sort of career interests in being allowed to do their research without people looking over their shoulder and saying this is too risky. Um, certainly if this does turn out to be a, a lab leak that has caused this terrible pandemic, then you can well envisage that regulatory authorities all over the world are going to look much more closely at what virologists are doing. So I think that that conflict of interest has been present from the beginning uh, and the two groups of virologists that capture the public narrative in the Lancet in, in Nature Medicine uh, uh, had, had this uh, interest probably at the back of their minds, but people should not have accepted their word alone. There should have been other biologists that 
uh, joined in. Uh, and unfortunately, the whole scientific community just lapsed into silence. There was no discussion of lab leak among other virologists or, or other biologists. The mainstream journals uh, failed to publish any articles skeptical uh, of natural emergence. Uh, and so there was just, uh, I hate to call it a conspiracy of silence because it wasn't a conspiracy. Uh, it wasn't a conspiracy. It was just the scientific community failing, in my view, to shoulder up to its public duty and try and give the public the best information on this very important issue. Yeah, you end your article with a pretty powerful statement of professions who cannot regulate themselves deserve to get regulated. Uh, I think that's pretty true of most professions, all professions. It's hard to regulate yourself. But that's certainly an article uh, argument that's coming through and some of the reporting that we've been doing, but also this piece as well. John, I think that's the takeaway from, from Elizabeth Eve's piece. And I think that the piece on Laura Kahn's piece on our site now as well, I think you'd agree. Yeah, yeah, it's, com it's absolutely true that the current regulation regime for biosafety labs and deciding how gain of function research is approved and whatever, it, there really isn't an effective oversight mechanism and it really needs, there really needs to be one. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really important takeaway from this, needless to say. Okay, let me go to, thank you both for getting us started. There's a lot on the table, some good questions coming in. Do use your Q&A box for, uh, for questions. Let me start with one from uh, Drake Bennett from Bloomberg Business Week. And also I think uh, Anya Labno from our governing board had a similar question. Uh, this is uh, to quote, virologists um, who are skeptical, so Nicholas, this is to you, virologists who are skeptical of the lab leak hypothesis argue that evidence for natural emergence has only grown stronger over the past year. In particular, they point to the recent sequencing of the sarbi co viruses from uh, Cambodian Thai and Japanese bats offering compelling evidence of the likelihood that SARS-CoV-2's furin cleavage site evolved naturally, not in a lab. Do you find that convincing? Uh, no, and that isn't really what the virologists are saying uh, if, if we're looking at the same paper. I mean, firstly, there has been no direct evidence for natural emergence or indeed for lab leak. These are two hypotheses for which we have no direct evidence. So this, uh, this new information from the bats in, uh, in, in Cambodia and uh, Thailand uh, 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 comes in a paper by the same authors uh, as, as wrote the uh, Christian Anderson Nature Medicine letter. Um, so you, they certainly you have an interest, I guess, in, in supporting their, their public um, position. Uh, but they don't say that this is compelling evidence. They say what they found is, is consistent with the idea of natural emergence, and that's perfectly true. And what they found is simply that um, in, in SARS-CoV-2, uh, this thing, the furin cleavage side that makes it so much more in, infective is inserted at exactly the right point. It's, it's sort of halfway through the spike of this protein, or what's called the S1, S2 junction. And the new information shows that these new sars viruses also have inserts at this same place. So that's interesting. It's not the same insert as SARS-2 has, but it does show that this is a, what virologists call, uh, is, a, is a hot spot for recombination. That's how viruses gather new information. So it's interesting. It, it doesn't, it's not conclusive proof of anything. Mm -hmm. And what do you make of his, his statement that evidence for natural emergence has only been growing stronger? Can, can you, uh, I, I don't want you to speak for him, and, um, but what's your sense of, of that? Are both, are they, is that true? Are, is, is that a piece of it or what are you seeing? Well, one of the things, uh, let me just say, one of the things from your article that I found interesting was how quickly some of these other viruses have been, the origin has been established. And that with this huge global look into the origins of it, what you were suggesting in this is we should have seen more by this point. Um, well, that's correct. Yes, with SARS-1, uh, we found the intermediate host, I think after three months. And with MERS in 2012, uh, after seven months, we knew the intermediate host. So these epidemics leave copious fingerprints, uh, footprints or whatever in the natural environment. So it's very puzzling that we've found none of these 
uh, footprints for SARS-CoV-2. So I don't know what the questioner means by saying the evidence has grown only stronger. That there is no evidence to begin with, uh, so it can't, there's no direct evidence to begin with. And what he's referring to is, is sort of circumstantial evidence, like finding this this uh, recombination site in other bat viruses, which is interesting, but as I said, in no way conclusive of anything. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say there's a big conversation going on about probabilities, the probabilities of it being natural or lab leak or whatever, when the two possibilities, the evidence for them is essentially all circumstantial. And I just think that's kind of a fool's game to play. It's more probable this, more probable that. It's like, let's look at the evidence and then go do like the real investigation on the ground that will provide like direct evidence. You know, until then, I just, I'm not a fan of the prob probability game. Let me move to a question from Rob Sokolow uh, at Princeton, member of our science and security board. Uh, he writes in, Nick, you did an amazing job of investigative journalism, but how many others could have done something similar, especially how many virologists could have known what you found out? How many people in the US NIH would have been aware of the required periodic reports to the NIH from the investigator? Doesn't this mean that the blame for not investigating the lab leak hypothesis goes well beyond the Chinese government? Uh, well, the first question, uh, anyone could have uh, found out what I found out. It was all out there in the, in the public domain. So I think you have to say this is a systemic failure by science journalists to have probed into the greatest science story probably of their lifetimes. Uh, they, they got caught up in this uh, mindset just as everyone else did, but they were on the front line. So it's most regrettable that they've failed to, to find out the same things as, as I did. Um, the, the, the question of the uh, blame for uh, the funding of uh, Dr. Xi, I think this is a, a very complicated uh, question and we don't really know the answer yet. I, I am disinclined to uh, blame Dr. Fauci as, as, as well as people have done for what Dr. Xi did in her lab. I mean, after all, if there was an accident in uh, with re research that he'd funded in Boston, say, we wouldn't first look to Dr. Fauci, we'd look to the lab director to ask if he was following appropriate guidelines and so forth. Um, it was perfectly, perfectly correct for Dr. Fauci to be very concerned about these coronaviruses, which after all had produced two epidemics already. So he wanted to look into them. He, he formed an alliance with China's leading coronavirologist, Dr. Xi, and started funding her lab. All that I think is perfectly, is perfectly reasonable. Now the question is whether she went beyond, whether Dr. Xi went beyond the terms of the grant that Dr. Fauci had given her, and, and this remains an open question at present. That raises for me the question of the moratorium we haven't really talked about that was placed on gain of function um, uh, research. And your, your article was used in some, uh, in, uh, in, by, by uh, members of, of the US Congress to look into what, why there was, uh, why it was listed, why this was, uh, there are exceptions made. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the moratorium on gain of function and where that is now and any thoughts you have on, on what it should be? Well, I think the heart of the difficulty here is that there are two definitions of gain of function. So the common sense uh, and perfectly reasonable definition is it's anything you do to a virus to increase its uh, pathogenicity. But the moratorium um, that was imposed on funding uh, from 2014 to 2017 uses much narrower language. It says only if you're working with a, a SARS-1 virus or MERS virus or, or influenza virus, must you be careful not to increase its uh, infectivity, transmissibility and so on. So Dr. Xi was not actually working with, with the SARS-1 virus. She, she was working with viruses very like it, SARS-like viruses they're called. So on a strict legal definition, she, uh, she, she was, uh, acting within the terms of the moratorium, rather, since this concerns funding, not research, 
Dr. Fauci and the NIH were acting within the terms of the of the moratorium because Dr. Xi was not actually working on SARS-1. However, if you're messing around with coronaviruses, which you know are highly dangerous because that's the reason you're interested in them, and you take a virus similar to SARS-1 and you start souping it up with genetic methods, you're clearly doing, you're, you're clearly into very dangerous territory. I think the question is, you know, did the NIH know what exactly what um, Dr. Xi was doing? Uh, and more importantly, was Dr. Xi sending back reports to uh, uh, Dr. Peter Daszak at the EcoHealth Alliance in New York? Because he was the principal investigator. He was the prime recipient of NIH's money. And Dr. Xi was his sub grantee. So was she sending back reports? If so, could we please see them? And so far they've not been made public and they probably contain a great deal of very useful information. And it's a great mystery to me why NIH has not required Dr. Dashak to hand them over and, and to make them public. I see John's story lights going on all over the place. Um, let me move to a, a question from uh, Hugo Rovagati. Uh, and this has come up in the comment section of our uh, of, of our page. Uh, so I want to ask it for that reason. I know that it's uh, come up a lot. Um, so it represents a, a set of questioners. It has been shown by Stephen Quay and others, so-called no techno uh, technology employing enzymes to us is clearly involved in virus uh, SARS-CoV-2. Could you comment on the importance on this finding, which strongly suggests genetic manipulations? Well, the importance is simply that the Anderson letter of March 2020 that was so influential in persuading people that lab leak was impossible said that the virus clearly had not been manipulated. Now, the problem here is that they were going beyond uh, their knowledge. You cannot tell whether a virus has been manipulated or not. There are some methods of manipulating viruses that do leave fingerprints, but there are other methods that do not. And so one is the no method the question refers to, and the other is some serial passage where you just um, uh, grow the virus in, in one animal after another so that natural select evolution at work uh, adapts it to uh, a, a new environment. There, there are no fingerprints left by that process, but it's completely natural, and yet the virus has been manipulated uh, in the lab. John, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think Nicholas pretty well covered it. I mean, the initial letter that came out saying it, you know, it wasn't man-made at all. It was complete. It had to be a natural occurrence. It was just misleading in that way. I mean, there there are ways within a lab that you, that you know the serial passage that he mentioned that leave no fingerprints in it. I just, I was surprised at the time that the letter was taken just as absolute fact by most of the media in the, in the world. It was really surprising to me. A uh, question from John Mulholland. Um, and we've seen this uh, quite a bit. It kind of echoes Rob Socklow's question as well. Um, Leitenberg reports that there have been many accidents of research labs where infections got uh, got out. We had some great reporting on that as well. What is your sense of this possibility? Um, this, and he writes, I guess as a trusting layman, I, I have always thought that this could not happen because of all the precautions taken. And I asked that question because after the article has come out, I've certainly spoken to people who've worked in labs and they said it's kind of surprising the level of lab security, right? That, that things that we expect to be at a level four, get recoded kind of to a level three and handled almost like a level two. Level two, one of the folks I was talking to said it's like padlocks and rubber gloves, right? Like how should we, how should we understand lab safety? Because regardless of, of whether this was uh, man-made or natural, I think this has put the spotlight on, um, on safety around bio labs. So can both of you talk about that? Well, uh, viruses escape from uh, labs all the time. I'm not saying it's terribly frequent, uh, but there, there has been about sort of one accident a year on average that we know about. And there are probably lots of other accidents that are not reported. So it definitely happens. Moreover, as you uh, implied, virologists 
code these uh, code the required safety levels far lower than they probably should. I mean, you might think that if you're messing around with coronavirus, you should do it at BSL level four. That's the highest of the four levels of lab safety. And all these pictures on the internet you see of Dr. Zheng Li Shi wearing a bubble suit and so forth. She's in the, the, the BSL-4 level lab they had at, at the Wuhan Institute. But, but, but all this is completely irrelevant because she did not do any of her experiments in BSL-4. She did them in BSL-2, which is being compared to about the safety of a, of a dentist's office, and in BSL-3. And we know that because she said so herself. It's also apparent in the descriptions in her papers. Now, now I should point out that she was following international rules for handling coronaviruses. I mean, she, she, was do, she wasn't doing anything that virologists all around the world weren't doing. So their rules say, if you're working with SARS-1 or MERS, you must use BSL-3. If you're working with any, any other coronavirus, you can use BSL-2. Well, obviously, if you're working with SARS-1-like viruses in BSL-2 and you create something that's more infectious than you expected, and if indeed you're not vaccinated against it because you've tried to make a vaccine and failed, as is Dr. Xi's case, then of course, it's very likely, very possible that the virus will escape. And that, I, I think, is what may have happened. There's a real surveillance problem, too, on these labs. I mean, we've done other stories where... Nobody really knows how many of these different kind of labs there are in the United States, say. There isn't anybody even tracking saying, here's the total number. And we, we just published a story this week. If a worker in a lab gets an infection, the CDC doesn't currently require that to be reported to health authorities. So it, it Nobody knows because it's not required to report this. And that would seem to be step number one. CDC should make this absolutely a reportable disease that has to go to state health departments so, so that they know if there's been a lab leak. Yeah, and that's coming from that Laura Kahn piece that is so eye-popping. We have a question for Rajaram Nagapapa. Um, is there any response to your article from Chinese scientists or Chinese scientific journals or media? Have you seen anything, Nicholas, John? Have you seen anything from it? No, not so far. Nope, not, not anything that I've run into. Isn't that amazing? Um, I think this, this um, well, let's see, that's a similar question that we just asked. Um, Oh, this is sorry, we've got like 90 questions in the queue. Um, talk, there's a few questions here, Nicholas, to, to talk about the conflicts of interest of uh, Peter Daszak's conflict of interest. It was in your article, you talk about it, but I see a number in, in the chat. Do you want to just kind of go through that again, just to spell it out for what you were seeing? Because it becomes so important when those when those when those scientists wrote a letter that was taken by the public as very seriously that this this was clearly natural and you've kind of woven through it why don't could you talk a little bit about that and maybe what implications that has for even today because you're connecting that to some of your more recent answers well this issue has to do with um, a letter that appeared in the lancet so, so this along with the anson letter in, in nature medicine these are the two letters that sort of set the public mindset and the press's mindset against um, lab leak. So in the Lancet letter, it says anyone who uh, supports lab leak is indulging in a conspiracy theory. Of course, this was natural emergence. We should stand shoulder to shoulder with our Chinese colleagues at the forefront of fighting the disease and so forth. This letter, it later turned out, had been um, drafted and organized by Dr. Peter Daszak, who is president of the Eco Health Alliance, which had funded Dr. Xi. So he, he would have an enormous conflict of interest because if the virus did leak from Dr. Xi's lab, he would be potentially at fault for not having overseen her better. This conflict should have been declared to readers. The editor of The Lancet should have made quite sure that it was declared to readers. He did not. The, the, the letter, in fact, concluded by saying, we declare no conflict of interest. Um, 
a question from Jack Wilkinson. The moment I finished reading this article, I wrote to Nicholas commending him for his bravery for writing it. But my question now is, have you experienced any unwanted pressure since the article was published? No, I haven't. That's great. Um, all right, from, from John Morrow. Beyond a lab leak, your thoughts on whether the involvement of the Chinese military suggests they were indeed aiming for wep to weaponize the virus. There's been a few questions on here about the Vanity Fair piece, I think, which begins to look at the Chinese military. Uh, you, you and your reporting stay pretty far away from that. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I felt the, the first um, step was to uh, try and ascertain whether this was lab leak, and I didn't try and go beyond that. I mean, it is possible there's um, military involvement. Now, if there were, my first thought would be that the military was simply trying to prepare a vaccine to protect its own troops, and that would be routine. Any military would uh, do that. Um, there's no evidence that the virus is a bioweapon. Um, I, I just think it's best to uh, stay clear from that and, until something positive emerges, if it ever does. Yeah, I think that's an area where it's real easy to really take eyes off the ball and ally yourself with conspiracy theorists. If you start talking about bioweapons, you know, there, I mean, if, if this virus was meant to be a bioweapon, it's one of the worst ever created. I mean, it's infected every country. I mean, you, you want a bioweapon that you can control. So uh, I think until and unless there's really strong evidence we're going to stay away from that, frankly. This is a great question from Gwen, uh, Dr. Gwen Dubois or Dubois. Um, do you think the real question on why publishing the bulletin made sense is um, what to ask the question? What research is too dangerous to do, and who gets to decide that? Uh, for example, to play, she cites the play "The Uncertainty Principle." I think it was also a movie on Netflix. Um, John, that's that's what we write on. Um, but but how are you thinking about it, Nicholas? How are you thinking about this? You know, this is this is fundamentally about the advancement of science and how we manage it and how we decide what's worth doing and not, and who gets to decide it because there's always implications. Let me start, John, with you because that's really what we're supposed to be asking and doing. And how are you thinking about that in light of this conversation? Yes, the bulletin was absolutely the perfect place to publish this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the reaction to it worldwide is, as I think, shown that. That's what the bulletin does. It does, in some sense, it's about holding science accountable for what it creates and making sure that that's for good, not for ill. And that's, that's our whole purpose in, you know, staving off existential threats by not having science and technology misused. And so, you know, if you wanted to pick a venue that highlighted Nicholas's great work, I think uh, it's just a, a wonderful happenstance that it showed up in the bulletin. And I hope Nicholas chooses us for his next blockbuster too. Thank you. Nicholas, what are your thoughts about that in terms of um, you've been your much of your career has been looking at, at these kinds of questions. Is there certain research that's too dangerous to do? How do how should we be deciding this? Well, science is a, a very important social activity as well as an intellectual activity, and we should be very careful about regulating it or, or thwarting the progress of science in any way. Um, it's hard to draw up any sort of general rules. I think this is an empirical question. I think you can learn a lot from uh, looking at various issues that have come up in the past in biology when biologists have come across a technique that they thought was dangerous. And for the most part, it seems to me, they've behaved very responsibly and creditably. And when we first learned how to move genes from one organism to another, uh, it was biologists who first drew attention to the dangers held as of semi-public conference of the cinema in 1975 drew up 
uh, uh, high safety rules that were sort of relaxed in the light of better knowledge. That's just the way a technique, an, an importance of new potentially dangerous techniques should be handled. And you, you see the same happening with um, gene drives where public, uh, people have brought this to public attention and discussed it, and also with the CRISPR technology. So it's uh, very puzzling to me and, and disappointing that virologists do not have, seem to have followed this path. Um, they have had a vigorous internal debate about gain of function, but it hasn't become public. Um, so there's been no public in, input to the, into this debate that I know of. And it may well turn out that it's this lack of public uh, input and independent oversight of virologists that has led to this unfortunate occurrence, if indeed there was a leak from the lab. Yeah, I, let me just pick up on it here because I really do think it's the essence of, of the bulletin and organizations like us. I think these questions are gonna come at us much faster than we're prepared for. You've mentioned questions around CRISPR. We have questions around geoengineering or the equivalent of hacking the planet, new breakthroughs in neuroscience about what it means to be human. There are big questions coming. And I agree with you, Nicholas, that uh, we don't we don't want to stop science because it's going to bring so many powerful goods to changing human life to to supporting human life and making it better and lifting people out of poverty. But it brings real risks, and I think the only way we regulate it to go back to to Dr. Du Bois is for the public to be very engaged in this conversation because these decisions will be made. It will be made around geoengineering about you know, what we can do uh, in, in the presence of global warming. There will be questions around uh, neuroscience and the kinds of research to be done on what it means to be human, on CRISPR, what it means to be human, on artificial intelligence. And these decisions will be made. And there's, there needs to be public engagement and conversation and, and um, attention because these are the questions of our times. The 21st century is truly, again, about the advancement of science in whole new fields. We just have a huge investment going in um, from the United States to compete with China because uh, on, on their research. And so I think that these conversations ha have to proliferate. Uh, these are the questions and they will be decided. And it's better if they're decided with our acknowledgement and awareness and more of this and conversations around the globe about it because they'll be decided and um, we should all be part of the conversation. So I don't think there's any easy answer and there's no body out there that's gonna save us. We just need to be really paying attention. So we're thankful for you to bring this question up because it's gonna be the first of many that are coming. Let me turn to uh, Arun Merkandandi. Uh, now that President Biden has ordered a probe into getting to the bottom of this hypothesis, Nicholas, what do you think might likely be the outcome of this investigation? Uh, my guess is that they will stick within the obvious framework, uh, i.e. there's no direct evidence for either scenario, but they will uh, presumably amass as much circumstantial evidence as they can. I think it's likely that they will conclude that, that uh, uh, lab escape is not only possible, but quite likely. Uh, and I hope that leads to pressure being put on the Chinese government for the first time to, to cooperate with the WHO in inquiry and to help the rest of the world make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. There's a couple of questions in the uh, that have been put forward about what could the Chinese offer at this point, um, given uh, how 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 difficult this reaction is going to be. Like, what could they what could they provide now? I mean, Nicholas, in your your answer, you talk about the response to the WHO, right? They would, they would need to, 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 to be able to show the, the path, but what do you think is reasonable at this point or what kind of organ, let me rephrase this question. What kind of organization or body would be reasonable at this point to help get to the bottom of this, this question? The WHO sent folks over, they were disappointed with what, they, what came back. The head of the WHO came out and said that, is there anything out there, any, any thoughts that you have of how we could organize something to, to get to the bottom of this, given now how politically sensitive, obviously, this all is? I suppose the WHO is the obvious body at hand. It's kind of discredited itself by uh, playing into the Chinese hands with its 
report, or maybe there are other bodies. I'm not an expert on this. I do think that the Chinese have available, should they choose to go the, the open route, a, a face-saving formula, which is simply that, um, well, hey, you, the US funded this research on our territory, dangerous as it was. Uh, sure, we let it escape. We're sorry about that, but there's sort of blame to share. And under that rubric, they could then start to be more uh, open with the information that we need. Yes, um, I, I, I do think ahead, John. that mm -hmm. the uh, intelligence investigation could possibly, from the American side, you know, turn up more indications or not of a lab leak. I mean, that just by going through what's in the United States, what was reported back to here, here, you know, the intelligence services can, you know, get some of that paperwork and assess and see whether there is, whether it's where the investigation stands now, which is you can't tell, or whether there's more indications of a lab leak, because I, I suspect that if there was a lab leak, you know, if there were problems, you know, with people getting sick and whatever, it, it may show up in some paperwork that's here in the United States. Great. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. I want to um, offer both of you a time just to wrap up. But before we do, there's many of you who have joined late just because of the time differences where you are. So a lot of questions coming on and will this be recorded? It is being recorded. It will be on our site um, by tomorrow, hopefully today. So you can share it or re-listen to it. Um, I do want to thank Nicholas and John um, for their uh, attention to this and for shifting a conversation that really need a worldwide conversation that needed to happen. Um, let me turn it over first, John, to you for any concluding thoughts and Nicholas over to you. Um, and then we'll close out our program. Oh, my only concluding thoughts is I hope that Nicholas's article spurs a more general focus on, you know, ethics in virology lab safety, you know, uh, in, in some sort of, you know, regulation may be the wrong word, but some better control of gain of function uh, research. Over to you, Thank Nicholas. This. I think this episode shows that there's been a, a fairly widespread institutional failure um, there are several institutions in our society which should have acted better and have not. And I'd start with the science journals, I think Lancet and, and Nature uh, used to be forums for neutral scientific observation. They would not get involved in politics and both these journals have, have done so in this case. Uh, Nature to its considerable shame puts a sort of warning notice on uh, on a uh, gain of function experiments for anyone who goes there saying, most scientists don't think this could have been a lab leak. It's highly inappropriate for the editor of Nature to put such a notice up there. I think science journalists have, have failed us, as I said before. I think the mainstream media has failed us by doing nothing on this story for more than a year. I think the scientific community has failed us by just sitting silently and saying nothing. Um, there are just so many things that have, have gone wrong. You wonder if there isn't. Uh, something we should uh, try and analyze there and, and hope we're doing better. Well, thank you for both of you. Thank you for your courage, um, John, in publishing it, Nicholas, for your courage in writing it. And also thank you for your carefulness in, co in constantly laying out the fact that, John, as you've said repeatedly in this conversation, there's circumstantial evidence on both sides and Nicholas for your laying that out, weighing it as you did, but always being clear um, that there's still a lot to learn on this. And I think regardless of the answer, this is there's clearly a story on the need for better regulation um, of the community, but also of bio labs in general worldwide, something that has been simmering, but not part of the public conversation. And regardless of the answer, I think this conversation shows we need a lot more attention to that. So on behalf of my colleagues and the board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, 
I want to thank you all for joining us and wish you all a good day. Ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. <laughs>